and even she's amazed by everything that, everything that she sees at this floating world temple. And the young monks, this very powerful scene, they had salted red herrings in their sleeve pockets and wrapped them in pieces of old calligraphy practice paper covered with half-written Buddha names. So you see how that they're putting on the show of this uh, religious aspect while they are indulging in meats and fish. They're supposed to be vegetarian uh, at this point. So you see that hypocrisy really in a powerful kind of way. In the teacher calligraphy and manners section, we have some irony here. She's the one teaching these young people, uh, other people's daughters. Uh, so that sounds a little bit dangerous already, doesn't it? Uh, you know, heck, now at this point you're down to a teacher, so you know you're really sinking. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, it kind of re reminds you perhaps of bad teacher with Cameron Diaz, and she's the one having to, again, uh, demonstrate uh, what's, what a proper woman is supposed to, to do and to be. But notice she has to give up relationships with men uh, to avoid the rumors. And, of course, that kind of sets up the drama there because we know, based on what we've seen so far, this is going to be pretty challenging. And almost every writer likes to kind of give a narcissistic sort of shout-out to promote themselves. Kind of think of what Kanye West does. Uh, he's equal to Shakespeare, at least in his own mind. And... Uh, Notice here, truthful brush strokes go straight to the heart. As you read, you will feel as if you're meeting the writer who's right there with you. So you can kind of see how Ihara Saikaku is also talking about himself here. And this episode has a, also a little bit of that uh, Cyrano de Bergerac kind of aspect to it, uh, where she's going to become entangled with the person she's trying to help. One uh, thing to kind of notice here is, what are your thoughts here with the disrespect and violence against her? and uh, her reaction to it. Uh, that's definitely uh, a, a pretty disturbing scene at the end of this particular section. In the Stylish Woman Who Brought Disaster section, we have that jealousy meeting, and we see again how women, even at various levels of society, at the higher levels, have this uh, intense, uh, these intense emotions that they, they have to repress so much. And so at the jealousy meeting, they just kind of let everything go. It's like a twisted session of anger management. Uh, they really don't have a voice in that society, and this is their chance. And you see how primal and brutal it becomes. Uh, that doll symbolism is especially intriguing. Think of supernatural movies like uh, the Ring series, for example. Uh, and again, the objectification of women as dolls, this life-size doll that looked like a real woman. Uh, their personalities, uh, their true characters are being uh, controlled, repressed on some level. In a, if you looked at this from a feminist type of interpretation. An interesting historical detail here is the blackened teeth, uh, which was practiced by married women. It was also a, a way to prevent cavities. It served as kind of a veneer. So there's a tradition there with that. And if you kind of look at it at, at this uh, particular scene with where they they bury the doll, um, you know, it's this possession idea going back to that supernatural aspect. Uh, I'm sorry, they burn it so completely that nothing will remain, and they they bury it, and then you can still hear that wailing voice. You have this in other cultures. A woman hollering creek uh, is a famous story that deals with that uh, particular mythology and folklore. Uh, again, this idea of a voice for women, you can see it on that kind of symbolic way. Are they truly alive, the women in this society? Are they kind of walking ghosts or the walking dead, if you want to refer back to uh, that current TV series? Um, so, you know, you, you have a tradition of uh, women characters in literature with no names. Uh, the yellow wallpaper, uh, for example. So a very kind of haunting, powerful scene. And then we come to the final episode, really, of the narrative, which is the 500 disciples of the Buddha. And the narrator feels his sense of shame, and uh, she kind of looks to find someone she knows. And you really kind of, this really a very powerfully emotional scene here. Uh, and she looks over, she, you really feel she's really alone at this point in the story. And she looks over the wooden statue. She saw the disciples, who obviously were men with whom she'd shared a pillow. At least that's her perspective of it. In this episode, she really seems to 
understand at some level the true meaning of uh, Yukio that desire is suffering the world is not permanent this endless desire the uh, endless Buddhas is this aspect uh, and she has that reference to uh, the one individual but even he had died endless storehouses of desire that he was he too finally went up in crematory smoke that's also uh, a reference to the first paragraph the opening so we see how we're coming full circle back much like the chrysanthemum petals and then she really does believe that she recognizes all of these buddhas and with this she has a very famous line with this single body of mine i slept with more than ten thousand men if you want to kind of interpret the story in a spiritual way you can kind of see it that everybody is on a quest uh, on a journey of enlightenment uh, of spiritual enlightenment and so everybody is part of this spiritual journey that we're all on and so you can kind of see it that way you can also see possibly she's having a bit of a, a breakdown here with reality has she in fact slept with with all of these people interestingly in epic narratives you always have the hero at some point uh, goes through hell literally and figuratively really so here you have that experience where she her heart roars in her chest like a burning wagon in hell uh, this comment uh, from one of the, uh, the people comes up to help her does one of these 500 disciples resemble your dead child we have that sense of her lineage that she hasn't had children and that sorrow that sorrowfulness it's like the karma is kind of coming back now uh, from all of her past experiences uh, she makes up her mind to pray to enter the water and be reborn in the pure land so kind of this religious suicide with water and tradition traditionally in art and literature you have a lot of works that uh, associate women with water representing the unconscious in a, in a Freudian psychological way so for example Ophelia in Shakespeare's Hamlet dies by water and she's also associated with flowers and we have a lot of the flower imagery and symbolism in this text also uh, so the pure land as this nirvana this heaven outside of this endless cycle of rebirth this endless desire this endless suffering and uh, the pure land also associates with her question at the end of, of the story is is she pure or not and so we come to the central core of the narrative at the end here she's done this kind of Buddhist confession and she's cleared the clouds of attachment so in Buddhism desire is suffering attachment is suffering attachment to things to people uh, to those kinds of sensual experiences and now her mind is shining bright as the moon with this kind of nature and imagery uh, she has no husband or children so she has no reason to hide things she has been open with them um, with these two young men and you see that connection with others that we're all sort of Buddhas uh, on this path to enlightenment every experience is a way to grow in some way the lotus flower of course is very important in Buddhism as a symbol a spiritual symbol that from the muck uh, the base of the flower is hidden underwater in the muck and the slime these bad dirty experiences her uh, dirty profession as she puts it here from that can spring enlightenment uh, a spiritual blossoming in your life and that is uh, kind of that that imagery that we have here and she ends interestingly with a question is my heart not pure which leads to a possibility of interpretations but notice it's not a statement it's a question at the end and so that ends our discussion of life of a sensuous woman a really underrated masterpiece that is not really studied enough here in the West uh, which is really a shame and just the lessons the stories in it that everyone everything is interconnected that we're all on this kind of spiritual journey together is is really uh, fascinating and uh, important so I hope you enjoyed our discussion and I will see you guys next time so again I hope you enjoyed our discussion of life of a sensuous woman as we continue our journey through the great classics of world literature. Until next time.